Hey folks, so glad you were with us. My name is Jason. I'm one of the pastors at Clearview Community Church. Hope you're doing well wherever you are watching us today. For the past few weeks at Clearview Church, we have been in a series entitled Follow. We've been looking at this idea of the church. What does it mean to be the church, to be a part of a church, how the church functions, and why is it even important? We first established this understanding that when we say church in our culture, it brings all kinds of ideas up. What we often refer to as a location or a building. It, it can also bring up negative memories for some people because they've been hurt by people in the church. Or maybe for you, it's an outdated man-made idea. When in reality, the Bible depicts the church as a group of people who share the common belief in Jesus and have placed their faith in Jesus. The church are people from every walk of life, every nationality, every ethnicity, every social economic standing, everywhere from every walk of life. The church is more than an organization or an institution. The church is a group of people who believe in Jesus' teaching. These are the people that make up what the New Testament calls the church. If you've been following along with us, you may have heard one of the pastors use this phrase, being a follower of Jesus. As a church, we've actually condensed our mission to one simple statement. Clearview Community Church exists to see people become fully devoted followers of Jesus. But what does that mean? I mean, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? Well, that can be difficult to define in our world because everyone is following something or following someone. Just think of your social media. Who are the people you are following on Instagram and YouTube and Facebook and TikTok? Our world is fascinated with just obtaining a following. Your goal is to increase your following. Get as many friends and subscribers as possible. You can even take courses on learning how to, uh, how to get a better following and be an influencer. In a recent survey, 75% of children ages 6 to 17 wanted to become YouTubers as their career. 86% said that they wanted to post on social media for their job and to make money. The more followers you have, the more popular, popular you are, the more influence you have. But when we talk about following Jesus, it is much more than just a clicking of a link or subscribing or liking someone's post. It is more than just giving money to the needy and maybe attending a church service. Following Jesus goes so much deeper. So today we're going to look at what Jesus means when he says, follow me. What does that even mean for my life? So you have a Bible or a smartphone, I want you to grab it out. We're going to turn to Matthew 4, 18 to 22. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Now, if you are like me, when you read this, you wonder, what in the world is going on? Did Jesus just put some kind of rabbi trance on these guys, and when he says, follow me, they just kind of drop everything and follow Jesus? I mean, could you imagine hanging out at the beach and some random guy comes up to you and says, hey, Come follow me. It's just kind of weird. But the reality is they already knew Jesus. If you look back in John 1, 43, 45, you can look at that later. You'll see that the disciples already knew who Jesus was. They had met him and they'd actually started kind of following him. And this is kind of a common practice in the first century. You'd be under a rabbi's teaching, but you would also continue your family trade or business while learning from the teacher. We see again in Luke 5, for the third time, Jesus is actually walking on the beach and he calls to them, follow him. In verse 11, we read, and as soon as they landed from their boats coming back into shore, they left everything and followed Jesus. In this moment, they are fishing and Jesus calls them again and they leave everything. They would no longer remain in the family business and now they would learn from their rabbi. In this moment, they were full-time students of the rabbi. Jesus was calling them and now they are going to give up everything. The word everything speaks to all things of importance or one's life in general. They would follow Jesus and as was the custom of being under the teaching and the training of this rabbi, their desires would then be his desires. 
Their look on life will reflect his view of life. Their behavior and actions would now reflect their new teacher. I want you to catch this. Jesus has always been about gathering people to himself. Always been about gathering people to follow him. Jesus is not looking for those who are simply going to call him a good teacher. Who would say he's a good man. Who would even say they are Christian in their name. The word follow in the original language means to obey someone who takes the lead in determining direction, the route, the movement. It is complete submission of my will to the leading of the teacher and where he is going. Maybe you remember kind of playing this as a kid. Maybe you've watched your children play this. The game is follow the leader. Now, it isn't enough to have a group of kids walking behind one another. No, 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 no. That's not good enough. The point of the whole game is that those following need to listen and need to mirror the actions of the one leading. And trust me, if you don't, you'll get a five-year-old pretty upset with you that you're not listening to the leader. See, Jesus rounds up this group of guys, men from all different walks of life. He has, a fish, he has fishermen and he has tax collector and he has a rebel against Rome, this ragtag group of misfits. And he says, follow me. But what does that look like? I mean, if we are to mirror Jesus, what does it mean to follow Jesus? Well, Jesus gives us some answers to this question. Now, it's, it's hard hitting. It's kind of in your face. So stick with me. Hold on. We're going to be in Luke 14, 25, 33. Jesus has been teaching and healing people and people have been flocking to him. And he's very popular. Picking up in verse 25. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them. He said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters. Yes, even his own life. Such a person cannot be my disciple. Now, what in the world is Jesus saying? In verse 27, he goes on to say, whoever does not carry their cross and follow, that's the word we're looking for, follow me, cannot be my disciple. What does that mean? He continues to give a couple of illustrations, a couple of parables to kind of explain this. He says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and you are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation well, the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. And watch this. This is the punchline in verse 33. In the same way, in the same way as a king will consider his strength before going to war or someone building a house needs to calculate the cost. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciple. And what is Jesus saying here? I mean, this is intense stuff. Am I supposed to hate my wife and my parents and my kids? I mean, we read later in Ephesians in Paul's writing that as a husband, I'm called to love my wife as Christ loves us and willing to give my life for her. Doesn't that kind of contradict this whole idea of hate? It's, it seems a little confusing if you ask me. Well, if you read through the Gospels, that is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you will notice that people absolutely love Jesus. They follow him everywhere. Even when Jesus is trying to get some alone time, they still follow him. And who wouldn't love this guy? I mean, he's healing the sick. He's welcoming the outcasts. He's teaching about God's love. Entire towns would clear out and just come and listen to Jesus. At one point, Jesus had 5,000 men following. And that doesn't even include the women and the children. So when we look at Luke and he says a large crowd, that might give you some perspective. We could potentially be talking about like 10,000 people are following Jesus. And the people are following Jesus and expecting him to deliver them from the hands of the Romans. You see, Rome dominate the world at this point. They're oppressing the nation of Israel. And they are believing Jesus is going to be the king that will bring prosperity to Israel. So when Jesus turns to them and says, if anyone wants to be my disciple, what do you think they're waiting for? They're waiting for some instructions here. If anyone wants to be my disciple, you're going to help me overthrow Rome. You're going to help me bring prosperity to Israel. They expect Jesus would say, if anyone comes to me to be my disciple, they will have wealth and honor and abundance. I'm going to make them great. And, and actually, you might have heard people say that about 
following Jesus. If you follow Jesus, you're going to have wealth and health and prosperity. So just let me be clear. Jesus never teaches this. Jesus never teaches that in following him, everything in life will be easy. Now, he promises to always be with us, but never that life will be full of daisies and butterflies. He says, if you are to be my follower, then love me better than anything in the world. Love me more than your family and your wealth and your success and your desires. To truly follow Jesus means he has become everything to us. Nothing is to be placed above Jesus in our lives. In following Jesus, you are pledging your loyalty to him. As Matthew Bates puts it, you are pledging your allegiance to Jesus. So when we say, I'm a follower of Jesus, or as a church, we state, we want everyone to become follower, a fully devoted follower of Jesus, it goes deeper than simple trust. When Jesus says, follow me, it is more than a simple logical conclusion. Yeah, I should follow Jesus. Now, we read in Ephesians 2, 8, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God. So we know that we can't earn God's love. His grace is a gift from God, and, and I'm to place my faith in Jesus as the only one who can save me. But if we read Jesus' teaching, following him is more than simply blind trust. Trust or faith is also connected with loyalty. It is connected with this idea of action behind my faith or in conjunction with my faith. They're kind of the opposite sides of the same coin. Following. See, one of, one of my professors used this uh, illustration. He looked at the poem Flanders Field. And if you're not familiar with the poem Flanders Field, it was written by John McRae. He's a Canadian army doctor in World War I. And he writes it from the perspective of those who have died. And in the last section, it says this. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders Field. The word faith here is depicting more than just a trust or blind faith, but rather a trust of loyalty, of allegiance. If you break loyalty, if you break faith with us, we will not sleep. This is what Jesus means. When, we, when he speaks of following we are placing our faith in him. We trust in what he has done on the cross to save us from sin. But simultaneously, we pledge our allegiance to follow him. Faith is both a trust in Jesus' work on the cross, a new life that he offers us through his resurrection, while at the same time, a real acknowledgement of my allegiance to him. We cannot separate faith from faithfulness. See, Jesus goes up further to say to truly follow him we need to be willing to carry our cross. He says in verse 27, and whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. To a person in the first century, the cross meant one thing and one thing only, it meant death. For us, the cross has turned into a symbol of forgiveness and God's love and we wear it around our necks and we tattoo it on our bodies. But in Jesus' day, the cross represent nothing but torturous death. The Romans forced convicted criminals to carry their own crosses. Bearing a cross meant carrying their own execution device. Therefore, take up your cross and follow me means being willing to die in order to follow Jesus. It is a call to follow in the same way as the master. It's a call to absolute surrender. It is a call to putting my will aside for God's will. We carry our cross at the moment that we say yes to Jesus and we receive salvation. We carry our cross and we die to ourselves. I pledge my life to Jesus, and I die to my old life. So let me see if I can illustrate it this way. You, you see this? This is a fob for the gym membership that I have. Now suppose we meet one day, and you see this on my keychain, and you ask me, what is, what is that? And I tell you, oh, this is the fob that allows me into the gym to have access anytime I want. I love going to the gym. I love fitness. I love working out. And you respond, that's awesome. I love going to the gym too. I love training and getting in shape. Hey, we should go sometime. How about I pick you up tomorrow after work and we train together? But then I respond by saying, well, actually, I don't think that's going to work. And you say, why not? Well, I actually work out on Saturdays. That's the only day I work out, once a week. What would you say? You'd say, well, this membership 
that's kind of a waste of money. Why, why are you paying a monthly membership? You don't even use it. You, you don't really enjoy working out or getting in shape. You're, you're all talk, as the saying goes, and no action. Yet for many people, this is what it boils down to, their Christianity. You see, you follow Jesus and you've prayed when a pastor prayed for forgiveness, but being a follower of Jesus is more than just a mental acceptance. It, it is more than just an agreement. Following Jesus is faith and loyalty to Jesus as the Lord, the King of your life. So the church is more than just a gathering of people or a building. Now, now hear me clearly. God does call us to gather. As followers of Jesus, we are to care for one another and love one another and serve one another. Jesus wants us to be there for one another. And as Pastor Tony said last week, it's very difficult to practice all this one another stuff alone. So we are called and taught to gather together. But as Carrie Newhoff says, Jesus didn't say, attend me. Jesus said, follow me. And for many of you, your idea of following Jesus is to attend a Sunday gathering or watch a service online. Maybe you are a Christmas Easter kind of Christian. Following Jesus is so much more than that. To be a follower of Jesus is to repent and turn from the direction I was going to another direction in life. To place my faith and allegiance to Jesus. And I know we struggle with this. I know it's challenging. But changing my allegiance and following Jesus requires that I give up control of my life and my desires and my will and my power and I align with Jesus' desires and Jesus' will and his control and his direction and his power and his path for my life. And if I'm honest with you, that is not always easy because I like control and I'm a bit of a control freak. And you can ask my wife this later. I kind of want things my way, but following Jesus is, is ultimately about trust. Do you trust that Jesus' direction for your life and that following him is better than keeping control of your life and the direction that you would take for your life? Some of you would say a resounding yes. Yes, I trust Jesus. Yes, I follow Jesus. But have you given him control? Following Jesus is pledging allegiance to him, following him, putting my faith in him, even when I don't have all the answers. David Platt says, we are settling for a Christianity that revolves around catering to ourselves when the central message of Jesus is actually about abandoning ourselves. The central message of Christianity is not all about me. It's all about Jesus. So what about you today? What or who are you following? If you aren't sure, take a look at your actions and your habits and your thoughts because who you follow will establish your actions and your habits and your thoughts. Who are you following? Everyone follows something, whether friends or culture, family, selfish desires, or maybe Jesus. And maybe you're listening and you have never said yes to Jesus. You've never committed your life to him. You have never acknowledged your need to be saved. I would encourage you today, as we kind of wrap things up, you need to do some business with God. In this moment, Jesus is offering you a new life, a full life, an eternal life. Luke 9 says in verse 24, Jesus promises, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for, my, for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? The call to follow Jesus is one of abandon. But the reward of following Jesus is so much better. It is better than anything this world has to offer. It is forgiveness and freedom from guilt, healing from my hurt, and ultimately, life with Jesus. Maybe that's you today. And as I pray in a moment, I would encourage you to spend some time talking to God, even in your own words. And you could say something like, you know, Jesus, I, I believe that you died for my sin and you rose to give me a new life. And I want to turn from the life that I was living. And I want to follow you. I want to pledge my allegiance to you, my trust to you. Be the leader. We use the word Lord. Be the Lord of my life. And maybe you are a follower of Jesus and you're thinking, oh man, what does this mean for me? Listen, this is not meant to freak you all out, but perhaps you need a realignment in your life. Who are you following? What consumes your time? Is Jesus truly the leader of your life? And here's the great news. For anyone who comes to Jesus, Jesus doesn't expect you to do this on your own. Well, first off, he gives the church. He's given people to walk with you. 
Jesus also told his disciples the secret to faithful, faithfully following him. In Luke 6, 63, he says, The Spirit alone gives eternal life. Human effort accomplishes nothing. Jesus promised God the Holy Spirit would not only teach and guide you, but would live in you and empower you and strengthen you to follow him. So what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? A follower of Jesus is one who has pledged allegiance to Jesus and has placed their faith in Jesus for salvation. And when you take this step to follow Jesus, you will see that your life is changed and you begin to change the world around you as Jesus leads you. Why don't you join with me as we pray? God, we once again thank you for this day. God, I thank you for your love for us. Jesus, I thank you that we can be on your team, that we can follow you. And Lord, I pray for my friends right now, maybe those that, that are, are acknowledging, yeah, they, they've never said yes to you. God, I pray wherever they are watching, wherever they are listening, that you would stir in their hearts. Even in this moment, friends, that you in your own words would say yes to Jesus. Yes, Jesus, I want to follow you. I want you to be the leader of my life. Forgive me of, of the sins in my life and know that I have a new life in you. And maybe you're listening and you are a follower of Jesus. Maybe this, once again, is just a check, you know, just a realignment of your life. Who are you really following? Who is influencing your life? Jesus, I just pray now that we would follow you with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind and our strength, that we would love you, God, your name. Amen. So may God bless you with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships so that you may live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, and sickness so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and to turn their pain to joy. And may God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in this world so that you can do what others claim cannot be done to bring justice and kindness to those you encounter. Now, friends, go and be the church. God bless you. is 
the power of Christ in me from life's first cry to final breath Jesus commands my destiny no power of hell no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the love of Christ I'll stand Find my every bound. 